Hello, good evening. Welcome to Bible study tonight. Thank you for joining us. We are going to be um, studying our seventh lesson in the Uncovered series, and this lesson is the arrival of Christ. Last week, we talked about the history of Israel. We talked about how they wanted a king. God gave them a king, um, but the and and many kings after, but the, the majority of those kings did not follow after. God. We know that the prophets spoke many times of prophecies that a Messiah was coming, that a Savior was coming, that a Christ was coming, and that this Christ was coming to Israel to restore God's kingdom here on earth. When Jesus stepped on the scene, this was no surprise. He was the Christ. He is the anointed one of God. That's what the word Christ means, is the anointed one of God. The Israelites, however, didn't really understand why the Christ was coming. They felt like he was coming to overthrow the dominant Roman Empire to make them a powerful na nation again. And that was not the Christ's objective. His objective was to come and to save people's souls by overthrowing the devil, the sin, and the death that had entered into the world when sin entered into the world at the Garden of Eden. Let's read in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. I'm reading from the King James Version, and on the screen you will see the New King James Version. They're very similar, but there just might be a couple of differences there. We, um, this is a familiar passage of Scripture to many of us. We do hear this at Christmas a lot. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when his Mary... His mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. In these familiar scriptures, we learn several things about Jesus. First of all, we learn that his birth was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. In verse 22, it said that this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. We find that he was the son of God. In um, verse 18, or that what that which was born of her is of God. We find in verse 21 that he was going to be the savior. And we find in verse 23, the most powerful part of it all was that he was God dwelling inside a human body. This was a miraculous birth. And we read about this and then we don't read very much more about his childhood. We have one snapshot of the childhood of Jesus in Luke chapter 2. In verse 41 through 52. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing him and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. 
And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Just this little snippet that tells us, that lets us know that he was very knowledgeable, but that he um, submitted himself to his parents throughout his childhood. Before Jesus began his ministry, John the Baptist was on the scene. John the Baptist was sent as a prophet to help Israel prepare their hearts and their minds to hear from Christ. John the Baptist was actually a cousin of Jesus. He was several months older than him. If you read the story of Elizabeth and Mary, you, can, you will hear a little bit about that. But John was the prophet. He didn't preach in a temple or a synagogue. He lived off the land. He preached in the, in the wilderness. And he told the people to repent of their sins and to get ready to hear from God. When they received his message, John would baptize them in the Jordan River as a symbol of spiritual cleansing in preparation for the Christ's arrival. And this is where he got the name John the Baptist. John the baptizer you know it's not unheard of it's it wasn't wouldn't be unusual that this repentance would be accompanied by baptism because even in the t days of the tabernacle they the priests would have to wash at the brazen labor before they would enter in to the presence of God so this is this was not some anything new but it was John was using this baptism to signify repentance we'll read a little bit about John in Matthew chapter 3 beginning at verse 1 in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, or also Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle, about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey then went out to him jerusalem and all judea and all the region round about jordan and were baptized of him in jordan confessing their sins and when he saw many of the pharisees and sadducees come to his baptism he said unto them o generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire." The arrival of John the Baptist was also prophesied in the Old Testament. In uh, Malachi 3 and 1, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will pre prepare the way before me. Isaiah 40 and 3 is quoted here in Matthew, and it says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John's message was very simple. His message was to repent. To repent means to turn, to change your mind and your d direction. To repent is to acknowledge your sin to God when he convicts you of it and then stop practicing it. Sometimes I think we have a serial repentance. We repent, we feel guilty, we repent, and then we continue on and we do it again the next time and we feel guilty and we repent and we keep repenting over the same thing. That is not true repentance. Repentance is turning from the sin. 
Proverbs 28 and 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. I'll clarify there today on that confesses that in uh, we don't believe that you need to come and confess your sin to us or that you need to stand in the church and confess your sin to the church. You confess your sin to Jesus Christ. He's the one who knows already the end from the beginning and knows everything about you. It doesn't have to be a public confession, but the, the forsaking has to follow the repentance. John the Baptist's objective was to tell people to repent so they would be focused on the arrival of Christ instead of on their sin, to turn from their ways and just to begin um, a shift in focus. In the steps leading up to the ministry, Jesus was, in fact, the anointed one of God. But he submitted himself um, to John the Baptist for baptism, and that was a preparation for his ministry. He um, went to John in uh, Matthew chapter 3. We're going to start where we left off. We'll start with um, verse 13. It said, Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. For John, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? So John obviously knew who he was. And Jesus answering and said unto him, Suffer it to be so, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus did not have any sin. We know that um, it says in the Bible that he was without sin, even though he was tempted in every way that we can be tempted. But he was baptized to fulfill the righteousness, baptism being a part of the path to eternal life. At his baptism, God confirmed that Jesus was God, that um, he had confirmed his identity and that he was, it was time for him. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Um, then this was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We find that after this in Matthew chapter 4, that Jesus was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That was the beginning of his ministry. And when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple and says unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands... They shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he says unto him, All these things will I give unto thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaves him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. I want to point out whenever um, Jesus spoke the word of God, when he spoke that man shall not live by bread alone, that verses can be found in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 8 and 3. When he said, um, when the devil said, it, you, the angels have charge concerning thee, that's Psalms 91 and 11. And when Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, that's Deuteronomy 6, 16. And he said, thou shalt worship the, on, the Lord thy God and him only shall thy serve shalt thou serve that's deuteronomy 6 and 13 so we see that the um that jesus fought back with the word of god he had to know that word of god and we we know that he did based on the time even from when he was 12 years old 
when he was sitting in the temple, hearing them, asking them questions, and they were astounded by him. So we knew that he knew the scriptures. He fought back with the word of God. And the devil used his fleshly weakness, the desire for food, to challenge his identity. He'd been fasting for 40 days. He was weak and hungry. Um, sometimes we feel like we're going to die if we don't eat by dinner time. And this was 40 days and 40 nights, so we can imagine how tired that he was. It's really important that we ha know the word of God to prepare for battle. We can't just depend on um, what the preacher preaches. We can't just depend on that, but we need to study the word of God for ourselves. I'm going to give you a couple of extra scripture references that you can look up and um, study a little bit about knowing God's word. One is Hebrews chapter 4 and 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and 12 talks about the, wo the word being like a sword of, of the spirit that, that cuts apart even like the intentions and the, the thoughts of the heart. Um, Psalm 119, 11, um, which talks about hiding the word in your heart so that you don't sin against God. Um, Ephesians 6 and 17, which is the passage of scripture that talks about the armor of God and talks about the, the word of God being the sword of the spirit. And James 4 and 7 as well. Um, I'm going to read that one to you really quickly. It's, it's not one that is quite as familiar. Um, and it says, submit yourself, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So that's those are some helps with learning how to overcome temptation and to be able to um, fight the spiritual battle that we all must fight. When Jesus began his ministry, after overcoming the devil, he traveled from place to place and he instructed people to repent. He was for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He wasn't talking about a physical kingdom, but a spiritual one. We know that even his disciples sometimes didn't fully understand that. They thought that he was building a following and that one of them could sit on the right hand and one on the left when he was in the power um, but in reality, he was not speaking of that. He was speaking of the spiritual one that came to destroy the kingdom of Satan and to destroy sin so that humanity could be born again into the kingdom of God. John 3 and 3, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Of God. As Jesus preached, he began to invest in the lives of others. He called out certain individuals to be his disciples. Disciples would be the ones who walked closely with him, that lived with him. Um, you, could, you know, we, we read of parables when they say, Lord, we don't have any meat. So, you know, they ate together. They worked together. Let's read um, about the calling of the disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two uh, brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called to them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Disciple means a follower or a student of a teacher. The disciples were the one who had received the most powerful revelations. They were the ones who had the desire to know him. They were the willing to sacrifice all. You know, they left the ship right there and went on to follow him. They went on this journey toward to following Jesus, not knowing exactly where it would lead them. Becoming a disciple of Jesus is should be our desire of as well. In order to for our souls to be saved from sin, we have to become followers and students of the man who knew no sin. That is our purpose in life is whenever we whenever we repent of our sins, when we are baptized in the name of Jesus, we 
are signifying that we are laying down our sins and that we are going to follow after him. Will we be perfect? No. But should we continually be seeking after him, seeking after his word and trying to learn more about him, to know more about him, to do as he wants us to do? Yes, that is the goal of a Christian. The Christian is to be a disciple, a student of Jesus Christ, one who is endeavoring to become more and more like the master. John 8, 31 and 32 says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. As we wrap up this lesson about the um, arrival of Christ, I want to leave you with that this week and encourage you to continue in your endeavor to be a disciple of Jesus, to abide in the word. Take some time to read the Bible every day. It's easy to get too busy. It's easy to um, get distracted. But if we make it a priority to know the master, to know the one that we are following, then truly we can become disciples. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we finish this lesson tonight? Lord, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. I thank you that you came so that we could be saved. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us your spirit to lead and guide and your word to teach us how to live. I pray for everyone who watches this video. I pray for every member of the church, even though we haven't seen each other in a long time. God, that they would continue to seek after you, after your word, and after the things of the kingdom of God. We pray, Lord, that you would keep your hand up on us, that you would keep us safe, oh God, and that you would help us to become disciples following after you more and more. Lord, I pray for your blessing on your people. I pray for your blessing on us as we endeavor to be your disciples so that we would reach out to others and that they could be disciples as well. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great rest of the week. We'll see you again on Sunday morning.